All right, let's get started. This is 6858. Um, and uh, today we're going to start discussing our first paper that we actually read uh, for this lecture. And this paper is trying to talk about uh, the sort of broad question of system architecture for security. So how do you actually architect your overall computer system to provide some degree of security? And uh, the goal of security architecture, sort of this overall structure of this paper describes as one case study from Google, is to make it easier to provide security for the things you're running in this environment. So the goal for some security architecture like what this paper describes is really to come up with a good structure that's going to help you prevent attacks. So ideally, this structure, this design, is going to actually prevent known attacks that... Uh, or at least, uh, well, not, not all known attacks, right? So this security architecture isn't the plan to defend against every possible threat. And uh, of course, there's some job left for the application developer and so on. It's not that the overall architecture is going to catch everything. But hopefully, this architecture is going to make it much easier to prevent big swaths of well-understood attacks, avoid them. Ideally, it's also going to prevent attacks we don't know about. So, you know, yet unknown attacks. Also would be good if somehow this architecture helped us design really robust systems. That would be cool. And maybe the last thing that we, you might ask out of a system architecture is sort of separate from preventing attacks, which is good when you can do it, but uh, not always possible. It would be really nice if we had a good plan for limiting the damage. So it's almost inevitable at some point you'll have a, an attack that succeeds if it's a large enough system and interesting enough. But... Uh, would be good to have a plan to limit the damage. So even, a, even if an attack does occur and gets by your plan for how to prevent them, that would be good if it wasn't too big of a deal. That make sense? So that's roughly what we're, I think, uh, trying to get out of this case study, is how do we architect our systems so that they're reasonably resilient against attacks uh, instead of us having to carefully start from scratch in every program that we write. And roughly, sort of, the, the thought process is, uh, first, you have to figure out what it is that you want to do, right? So you need to figure out what your goals are, what are you defending, and what kinds of threats that you want to address. And this paper isn't really, I think, articulating the thought process that went behind this for Google. There's uh, sort of, they're, they're sort of implicitly stated in the paper by virtue of them trying to defend against certain things or trying to provide something even if an attacker is out to get you. Um, so that's one thing you've got to figure out for your security architecture. But then what this paper does talk about quite a bit is how do you get there? What are sort of the big ideas? And you see a bunch of things show up in this paper. So, you know, they talk a lot about trust and figuring out who trusts whom. How do you make trust explicit? The use of isolation. The use of uh, access control, authentication. Turns out to be a big deal that the platform or the overall architecture provides itself secure channels between components and so on. So this paper is much more heavy on the mechanism and what exactly happens. Maybe not so much about why and what the initial goal was that this paper is trying to satisfy, but you know, we can try to guess maybe in discussion and see what these guys are trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? You guys had lots of questions. I tried to respond to emails to the extent that I didn't run out of time preparing for the lecture. But uh, feel free to jump in and ask questions during the lecture as well. Um, so the case study, as you've already read, right, so is uh, this particular paper from Google that describes at least one part of their security plan for their cloud platform and also various cloud services. So this sort of encompasses things that you might use at Google, like Gmail or Google Photos, Google Contacts, Calendar, etc., but also uh, Google's platform that allows other people to run stuff on Google's cloud. So you can get a virtual machine on Google and run your own thing there in their data center. And this is the same platform that underlies these public-facing virtual machines as well. Make sense? So why are you guys writing such a paper? A bunch of you guys were confused. Why would they write, write this design document? <laughs> 
Any thoughts? Is this a good idea? Yeah. Yeah, so one good thing about this paper is that you might expect, I think as you were saying, that potential customers of Google will look at this and say, oh, wow, these guys actually thought about this stuff. That's pretty cool. Uh, I should use them. So that's, I think, a, a big part of it. And I think, actually, the specific organization that published this is indeed the Google Cloud, whatever, branch or whatever, department. And they're probably, yeah, indeed trying to convince people to start using Google Cloud. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so, so indeed, it's a good, good point. It's just like Google generally, I think, uh, should be trustworthy, or that's what will be their goal, uh, both for cloud and other data. Uh, they're, like, they're being quite thoughtful. Anything back there? You had a comment? I see, yeah, yeah. So, like, if well, I forget who the CEO is, if they are called to yeah, testify in front of Congress, they're like, oh, yeah, we have a 10 page document. Well, it probably doesn't come up in, at the Congress level, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it makes, it makes sense, yeah. So it makes them look good, yeah. All right, uh, any other question? Yeah. Uh, if finds, like, by the document, yeah, so maybe if someone, someone like, this document is pretty high level in principle, so it's probably hard to read this and say, ah, there's a bug on page five. There's a, that's, that's the bug. But uh, in principle, yeah. I think it's also that this kind of level of information is, to anyone interested in how Google works, you could probably find lots of Google engineers that will somehow leak this information to you, or you could probe around and probably figure out how this works if you're sophisticated enough. So it's not really that this information was somehow stopping some attackers from mounting attacks. Um, and as we talked about last lecture, probably not a good plan to base your security on this kind of stuff being secret. Um, so probably, yeah, good marketing, maybe gets engineers excited about working on Google. All right, so what are the goals, I guess, uh, trying to sort of reverse engineer this document? What are these guys trying to protect? What's the big deal to them? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so let's think about, I guess, yeah, threats and the goals. So in terms of threats, indeed, so insider attacks feature pretty prominently in this document. And I think it's partly, maybe to some extent, a historical thing where and Google got burned by some insider attacks about a decade before this document came out. So I think they were really trying to make sure that doesn't happen again to them. Uh, but it, it's, it's like a real threat, even if it wasn't a, a thing they were trying to retro reactionary uh, response uh, would be a good thing to, to deal with regardless. What about, yeah? Uh, sorry? Yeah, so some, some, some kind of like supply chain or attack. So you buy a thousand servers and someone ships you a thousand and one servers with one of them being an extra thing that you didn't want and it's just like running the adversary software right there. You plug it into your network. That's, that could be a problem, yeah. Other threats they might worry about? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, attackers might want to access their data. So I guess that's, you, you could sort of think of as maybe separate from a threat, that's more of a goal, right? So there's probably lots of data. So, you know, protect user data. There's a, I think a big underlying theme in this document is they're thinking Gmail, contacts, all this stuff. We can't leak that, let that leak out, regardless of what the threats are. You know, insiders trying to get the data, vendors, et cetera, yeah. Yeah, so all, you're right. So, so physical attacks on data centers also a thread they w worry about. Someone just breaks into the data center and takes the disk. That would be one way to get the data. So other threats or goals, actually, right? Is it all about data to them? Other things they care about? Yeah. Oh, good question from the anonymous page. Uh, insider attack. So I think what Google is particularly referring to here is uh, they're worried that some of their employees might be bribed or might be malicious themselves. Maybe they're like decided, ah, I want this guy's Gmail data. I'll go get a job at Google. Uh, or they were bribed or maybe just their credentials were compromised. And then that 
person's account is used for an attack. Uh, varying degrees of that. Yeah? So goal is a sort of isolate services. So indeed, although I sort of think of it as like a technique, how do you get there? As like a top level goal, I think it's about sort of data. Maybe another big deal for them, I think is availability. So they want to make sure they don't lose your data, but they also want to make sure Gmail keeps running, even if something bad is going on. Um, any other things that you might worry about here? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I guess you're right. So, so it's good to point out, right? Like, so protect user data from being lost, but also sort of confidentiality and integrity. So not only is no one reading my Gmail messages, also no one's corrupting them. Yeah, good point. Back there. Yeah? Bugs, yeah, that's probably, should have been. <laughs> Right here, number zero, yeah. That's probably gonna do them in first. Uh, absolutely, so they're, they're worried a lot about bugs, uh, both in their services and the services of their customers, etc. And maybe along with this uh, notion that it's a public cloud, I think they worry also about, I guess, uh, malicious apps running inside of their data center because they allow customers to just run services side by side with Gmail in the same data center. So that would be potentially a, a thing to worry about. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so I don't know. I, I think partly that might be, why didn't they talk more about bugs? Well, they certainly said something about bugs. Like a lot of their isolation plan is because of bugs. And a lot of their sort of bug finding code review is for bugs as well. Uh, but I think part of it is also this document is probably geared more towards a, a marketing side, as we were talking about earlier. So probably some CEO of a company that looks at this document and says, bugs, 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 bugs. They're going to be more excited to read about a wide range of things that Google is worried about, uh, maybe not weighed by how likely that attack is to happen. Yeah. Yeah, question? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good one, right, actually, right. So, so they want to know if something goes wrong, they want to be able to figure out why it failed and uh, who got the data, even if they sort of failed at goal one. At least they want to know what happened back, yeah. There was a question back there? I think I missed, uh, maybe not, oh yeah. Yeah, so I think, uh, I guess, yeah, so, so uh, threats being, yeah, sort of DOS attacks, maybe, uh, I guess in general, right, like, maybe an, uh, uh, yeah, sort of a combination of, like, you know, why, why are bugs important? Well, there's going to be some, some garbage coming from the Internet that's going to exploit a bug, yeah, but indeed, so, like, untrusted Internet traffic, I think, is a big deal to them, absolutely. All right, so I think this covers it pretty well, so now let's try to figure out how are they going to try to <laughs> make some sense of, these goals and threats in their data center. So to give you some context to try to discuss how their system works, let's talk a little bit about a simplified view of what their environment looks like for the purposes of what this paper is excited about. So as far as I can tell, Google is really made up of a whole bunch of data centers, and each of those data centers has a bunch of server machines in them. So you know, here's a data center with a bunch of servers. And, uh, you know, there's probably other data centers over here, but let's look at one data center. Inside of a data center, um, there's probably, on each server, going to be a whole bunch of different virtual machines running. That's to share a single server machine between many workloads. So you might have, you know, one VM, two VMs running on this server, maybe another VM running here, something else. Um, and inside of VMs, it's all services, roughly speaking. Uh, so there's some kind of a service here. Maybe this is, I don't know, Gmail. And then here there's another service. Maybe this is a VM from a customer, from some cloud computing customer. So, you know, some service that Google doesn't really understand anything about. And here maybe, I don't know, calendar or storage. I guess they wouldn't be in the same VM, but 
It's all sort of broken up into services inside of VMs, or that's sort of the logical unit to think about. And then, in order to actually communicate with all the stuff running as services on top of VMs, uh, they have this thing called the Google front end. And this GFE, as far as I can tell, it's probably just another service somewhere, probably running on some VM, on some server machine, of course. And what this GFE does is that it actually accepts incoming requests from the internet at large. So it's speaking things like HTTP or HTTPS, maybe it talks SMTP. I don't know what protocols exactly it handles, but it takes in requests from the broader internet. And then for each of these requests, it deals with DOS attacks, as we'll talk about later, and then translates the request into an RPC, to some internal service. So it might be that this HTTP request came in, the GFE turns that into an RPC going all the way to this Gmail service. So this RPC request comes in. And then Gmail can, in turn, go and talk to maybe this calendar service, also issue RPC requests to it to say, ah, you know, I want to figure out if this user has a calendar meeting at the same time or whatever. Um, so that's sort of the very coarse-grained view of what is going on inside their data centers. Part, part of this whole structure is indeed motivated by some of their goals to defend it against attacks. Does that make sense? Roughly matches what you guys saw in the paper. Any questions? Okay, so let's try to understand what are the important pieces of infrastructure here. So the first starting point for pretty much any security plan, if you want to build a secure system, you have to isolate components. Unless you keep different parts in different boxes, you don't really have a hope for security. If you need to be able to keep the good guy in one box and the bad guy in a different box. And... Uh, Isolation is going to help with that. And in the paper, they actually talk about a whole bunch of different isolation plans. So they talk about virtual machines, of course. We talked uh, about them already. They also talk about using Linux user IDs. So a single Linux operating system kernel running, and then they run different applications or services, maybe under different Linux user IDs, as a way to keep them separate from each other. Maybe containers is the modern way to think of this. They also talk about using sort of other isolation plans like language level sandboxes. So this would be, I don't know if they literally use JavaScript or WebAssembly, but this kind of idea where you have code that you want to sandbox that's written in a specific language and you build a runtime that's going to run that code in isolation. So you could at least imagine maybe JavaScript or WebAssembly being the kinds of languages you might stick inside of a language sandbox. They also have other things like kernel sandboxes. We'll look at them maybe in later lectures. Um, does this make sense? Are, are there other kinds of isolation these guys talk about in the paper? Actually, yeah. Yeah, so that's like the strongest level, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's like physical isolation, separate machines. So one question you might have, why do they have so many different isolation plans? Why not just I don't know, do VMs for everything? Yeah. I see. So you're saying, like, one reason why VMs might be not so good is if you compromise a VM, then you might be able to then exploit some bug in the underlying virtual machine monitor to then break into all the other VMs running on the same machine. So then isolation is no good. Right, so indeed. So some, some degree of assurance is one reason why there's a whole bunch of these things. Another one is probably, relatedly, maybe, is cost. So physical machines, right, like really strong isolation, but you have to have a separate physical machine for everything you want to run. Not really cost effective. Um, other things you might worry about, presumably, are also performance. So some of these things, like maybe language level sandboxes, 
maybe impose a little bit more overhead, depending on exactly what you're thinking about running, whereas virtual machines or Linux users might be cheaper in terms of overhead. And another probably big thing going on is compatibility. It's like, how easy is it to apply one of these isolation plans to an application you care about? So separate machine, no question. Yeah, just like separate machine, man, just run it there. Or virtual machine, probably also almost anything you can stick in a VM. And then, you know, Linux users, probably many things you can stick in a container or as a separate user ID, but maybe not everything. And then for some of these kernel sandboxes or language level sandboxes as well, if your thing is not written in WebAssembly or JavaScript, well, you know, it might not actually work out at all for you then. But maybe it's a stronger level of isolation depending on what you care about. So there's a lot of degrees of sort of cons dimensions you might worry about when choosing an isolation plan. And we'll actually spend uh, two or three weeks later in this class talking about various isolation mechanisms and uh, what they're good at. Uh, but that's absolutely the main building block for security, both in this data center plan and many other systems. Make sense? Questions about this stuff? All right. So let's look at examples, I guess, in their paper. So in this case study, what do they really gain from using isolation? So I guess the baseline thing is uh, presumably virtual machines, right? So they have a Linux kernel plus a virtual machine monitor, so probably KVM running. And on top of it, they're running a whole bunch of different applications or services in VMs. So you might have you know, Gmail running here as one VM on top of this machine. And then side by side, you might have some you know, cloud customer workload. And well, isn't it nice that actually the virtual machine monitor prevents anything funny from going into the Gmail virtual machine, right? So you just can't attack the Gmail virtual machine uh, directly. You can't access its memory. You can't access its storage from, let's say, another virtual machine running on the same physical piece of hardware. So that's a nice guarantee that they give from isolation. So being able to protect sensitive applications or services. Another thing that we already mentioned to some extent is uh, trying to sandbox really suspicious or malicious potentially even uh, pieces of code. So this might be maybe if the Google Photos app or service needed to run some really fishy codec to process images, but you really don't trust this codec. It probably has a bunch of bugs, especially on untrusted images. Well, in that case, you might actually want a stronger degree of isolation for that. Maybe you'd actually recompile your codec into a WebAssembly module, and actually stick that into a WebAssembly runtime. So you might actually have a WebAssembly runtime inside of your Photos VM, and there you're running your really fishy codec. And the great thing there is that this probably provides a bit of a more degree of isolation than just virtual machines themselves in terms of likely bugs and how you can escape. And the nice thing is that now this malicious codec, slightly different picture. Gmail was all about protecting some sensitive stuff and preventing the bad guy from getting in. Here, you're really protecting the codec from getting out. You have this fishy thing, and isolation is also pretty good at that. You're running this codec in your data center, and you're going to make sure it's not going to tamper with other people. Make sense? So you get quite a bit of mileage of isolation, and I guess as we were talking about, for some services, they don't even trust the virtual machine here to keep the things apart. So for some cases, they use WebAssembly or some equivalent language runtime to keep suspect code in. But other times, it actually has a physical host, right? So this might be one server running a bunch of shared virtual machines. And then for other things, like their key management service, they mentioned this. That's a really important thing. So they don't even want to trust Linux to isolate the key management service from some suspect stuff. So they just dedicate some machines to running key management services and a couple of other things, probably like their cluster manager, et cetera. Make sense? So that's sort of this isolation story in this case study. Questions? All right. Feel free to ask questions through Kevin here, through the website form as well. All right. So once we have 
isolation, and we can keep the bad guys and the good guys apart, or at least different components apart. We also need sharing. We can't just put everything in a separate box because we need to actually have the whole system work together. We need to be able to send emails to someone. It can't be all in a box. Um, so for sharing, the way to, or a fairly common way to think about how to securely do sharing is what's called a reference monitor view of the world. That's a pretty common pattern you will see in a bunch of designs if you sort of look at it in the right way. Um, the way to think of a reference monitor is that uh, you have some important stuff in a box. Like you have a, your resource that you want to protect. So how do we think about allowing some sharing for this resource in an isolated box? Well, we're going to stick something in front of it called a reference monitor or a guard, depending on what terminology you look at. And this guard's job is to take incoming requests to this box and maybe execute them on the resource. So maybe the request is read my Gmail messages or add a calendar entry or start the service. And the way that you typically think about deciding or sort of securely allowing sharing in, in this context is to have the guard basically do three steps. So the first thing you've got to do is figure out who is even sending you the request. To decide whether this shared operation is okay, you have to be able to determine who it's coming from. That's typically called authentication. So step one, if you want to do sharing, you've got to do authentication. You've got to figure out who's talking to you from outside of your box so that then you can make some interesting decision. And typically authentication gives you an answer to who is, call, who is invoking this operation. That's typically called a principle. So some kind of an entity that sent your request. And then there's some request, I guess, associated with here that that principle wants to run. Now, the next step for the guard is to actually figure out, ah, I know who the request came from. Should it actually be allowed? So the next step you typically think of doing is authorization. So basically decide if this is an okay request for that principle to be making. And typically the way this looks like is there's some kind of a policy that is configured that tells the guard what requests are okay, what requests are not okay. There's many ways to configure this policy. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but then once the guard makes his decision, the last thing to do is to audit or log the fact that this request was approved. And this helps you deal with security problems. If you misconfigure the policy or something else went wrong, always good to have a log of security decisions. So there's some kind of an audit log here. And one thing it's important to have is make sure this audit log is actually in a separate isolation box from the rest of the system, right? So the reason you have the log is to recover in case of some problems. If you have a problem inside this box, like with this guard, it's a, there's a bug, who knows what happened, you want to make sure at least the log is intact. So it's important to actually stick the log into a separate component. So maybe you might stick it in a different virtual machine or a whole logging service. So that even if this main thing is compromised, you have some faith the log is in good shape. Make sense? Question? Yeah. So a question about services, can they not talk to each other directly? Indeed, the answer is, yeah, they just cannot talk to each other. So they're just different virtual machines, at least in this picture. So let's consider Gmail and this funky cloud application running side by side. Yeah, they're just like, they can't poke each other's memory. They can't start a process in each other's thing. They can't debug each other. No such interface exists. They're just completely separate virtual machines. And the only way they can interact with each other is by sending messages over a virtual network interface to each other. And that usually takes the form of this RPC. And for services running on other whole machines, then it's sort of obvious by construction. The only way to interact is through the network. And virtual machines strive to provide the same level of isolation that indeed they're so isolated, the only way to go around is to use RPCs. And these RPCs are basically going to be these requests coming into this picture. So the only way that these services in practice going through the guard. So as long as you get your policy right, hopefully you have some semblance of control over the kind of sharing that's going to happen between these components. So there's another question. 
Oh, yeah, sorry. So here I didn't draw. I mean, I'm sort of imagining it. Yeah, probably there's Linux here. And uh, I just didn't draw it because it wasn't an uh, important part of the isolation story. But it is. I'm, I'm sure every machine there runs Linux, at least to boot up. And then, you know, maybe you don't use it for isolation, but surely KMS is a Linux application running on top of a Linux machine. Yeah. You had a question back there? So I guess you're, you're basically saying, okay, well, you know, this policy is going to be complicated. There might be users here that are making requests, services, et cetera. You're absolutely right. Like, actually, quite a number of bugs happen for, from policies themselves. I mean, I gave you some bugs last lecture of example of policy bugs. This is sort of where the terminology policy versus mechanism comes from. The policy is like how you configure permissions, like access control, and this guard is sort of the mechanism implementing it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you could totally screw this up. Uh, it's a complicated piece for sure. And, uh, for example, if you partition it as you're proposing between sort of one policy for services, another policy for users talking to you, then you could have inconsistencies. So one general rule of thumb is to actually make things simple, like avoid special casing, just like make sure there's one path for everything. You have two paths, well, you might have differences and maybe they, may they matter. So indeed, I think important to have as straight line of a plan as possible for access control and securing your sharing plan. Make sense? Question. Why do we have, sorry, what? Why Linux? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think historically Linux has become pretty widely used for server workloads. It's easy, I don't know, well, it's like a whole other discussion, yeah, why is Linux popular <laughs> for server workloads? I think it's easy to configure, it's easy to understand how it works. And I'm sort of just guessing it's like a small fraction of, I'm sure, all the reasons why Linux is popular. Like if I want to get high performance, I can look inside the kernel and understand why am I not getting high performance, and I can tweak the kernel to get high performance. Or if I want to understand, what does it do? I open the kernel, I understand what it does for security purposes, for example. Like for Windows, for example, it's more complicated. Windows also seems to be targeted towards sort of graphical systems with a GUI, it's easy to manage Linux machines in some, I don't know. This is a philosophical almost debate, I think. Um, for them, I think Linux actually offers, you know, pretty good services for what they need. It comes with a nice virtual machine monitor, KVM. It's reasonably lightweight, reasonably flexible. They can patch it themselves. I'm sure they have a heavily modified version of Linux and KVM that is hardened and they maybe remove some features they don't need that they think might be suspect. Bug-wise, bug yeah. So. Yeah. Interesting question. I just don't, don't know how to summarize the answer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So can a cloud customer send an RPC to Gmail? My guess is that you could probably formulate that RPC request and send it out. But in fact, I think part of their story is that this guard shows up somewhere in this picture. In particular, they have this inter-service access manager component, I think, or what is it called? Uh, yeah, I think intra-service access manager, yeah. And that guy, you can think of as the guard for every request, for every RPC. And there's a policy that comes in that says who can send G RPCs to Gmail. And my bet is, like, the, the policy says, no, <laughs> cloud customers cannot send RPCs to Gmail. Uh, or you would hope so. I think they suggest as much in, in this write-up. But, yeah, Absolutely. So it is kind of an interesting plan in contrast, right? Like so, so many other cloud providers, you might imagine, you might, they might have like an internal network for Gmail services and calendar, and then a whole other data center or part of the data center for public-facing apps. But I think what these guys are realizing, or they're sort of, I guess, trying to suggest in, the, in this case study, is that uh, at a certain scale, it's really hard to draw boundaries between internal and external. So once you have thousands of internal Google services, it's not clear they're really that much better than some random cloud workload at that point. And if you put them on the internal side, and if you place any level of trust in the separation boundary, uh, that's going to be not a good idea. So at that level, you might as well forget this whole separation into a trusted versus untrusted network. They make a big deal of that in the write-up here. <laughs>
then might as well just throw everything and allow the cloud customer to even formulate that RPC. And then, of course, hopefully reject it always, but yeah. good question. Other questions about this design plan for them? Yeah. Um, so I think this is basically a picture that suggests how you should think about structuring your service. So I think roughly this is a good idea for whatever it is that you're protecting. Like maybe this is the whole RPC system, or maybe this is just one service. Like maybe this is Gmail, or maybe this is the storage engine. I think all this picture is really suggesting, this is sort of a logical view. All this picture is suggesting is that whatever you're protecting, you better have one place where you're making access control decisions. Because that's going to make sure you can look at it, you can look at the policy, and you can convince yourself, for example, that no cloud customer can send RPCs to Gmail. You can look at one place, yes, that's true, good, done. If every component implemented their own guard, that might be a much more complicated story, because if you now had a cloud customer, the cloud customer could send an RPC to a whole bunch of machines. Every service has their own guard that implements policies for RPCs differently. Maybe most services get this right, but some service accidentally accepts RPCs from some cloud customer. That would be unfortunate. So I think really economy of mechanism is important here because the more code you have that's separated out, the more likely you'll have bugs there. How, a, the and what if the guard <coughs> How do you update the policies and what if the guard is buggy? Those are fantastic questions. I think if the guard is com compromised, you're in big trouble, but at least you have the audit log in a different box. So that's why you have the log in a box. Um, if, if you've got to update the policy, probably what's going on is that the policy is maybe part of the resource or maybe it's, there's some other operation that lets you change the policy. And indeed, a tricky question is how do you actually decide who can change the policy? How does this, that evolve over time? We saw examples of this going bad in last lecture. Um, so you have to think carefully about how to set the policy so that there's not some you know, unfortunate loop here. Um, but you know, reasonably common answer is you know, maybe one operation of the guard on a resource is actually to change the policy. If the, if the policy is part of the resource, then ah, you can sort of change it and move on with your life. Other answers might be that actually the policy comes from somewhere else, from the administrator. So there are some situations, like I guess let's talk about the example in this paper. I think one example where the policy is really part of the resource is something like Gmail or contacts, where a request comes in, and no one really outside of the calendar or contacts or Gmail app really knows what user that means and the application itself is going to have to maintain this policy and maybe the user has a say into what the policy is for who can access your calendar entries. So that's a case where the policy is really part of this box, part of the resource. A totally different story is the policy for RPCs. So in this paper, the RPC system also looks kind of like this guard model. And there, it's not like the service is in charge of its own RPC policy. It's really the developer that deployed a service that also specifies, here's the policy for my service. So even if the service is poorly written and tries to accept garbage RPCs from somewhere in the world, the policy that comes along prevents it from doing that. So you separately send the policy to the RPC layer and say, huh, don't let anyone talk to my service. And the service can't even ask to bypass the policy. There's various schemes there. These things are typically called discretionary access control versus mandatory access control. So discretionary access control is the case where the service manages its own policy, roughly speaking. Like as a user, I can set permissions on my calendar entries. Mandatory access control is there's some administrator, like the deployment engineer, that comes in and says, ah, that's the policy. No matter what the service says, don't let it talk. Those are the various ways you typically see these policies configured. Make sense? Other questions? All right. So I guess this is roughly the plan here. Uh, authenticate, who is calling, authorize, and audit. And uh, typically, this is a pretty broad sort of view of what you might imagine, right? So these principles, we've talked about a couple of these examples already. Um, but of course, the principle could be some person making a call. Um, could be actually another service. We also talked about that. But could be also a computer. So we haven't talked so much about that, but the computer that boots up is probably yet another principle that can make a request. So they make a big deal of this with our trusted, you know, with our secure chip in their servers where computers boot up and the computer is an entity of itself. It needs to join the system and we need to talk about is that a trustworthy computer or server 
or not. So that's just another principle in their RPC scheme, I believe. And uh, the kinds of resources you could also imagine being fairly different. So uh, we talked about sort of whole services being an, a resource you could talk about. So the R, for the RPC library, as far as it's concerned, it's managing a bunch of different services. Those are the resources you might worry about. But also within a single service, it might be finer grain. So the Gmail service might talk about a single email message being a, a resource. Um, or you might even think about something like the cluster manager being a service for maybe a new server booting up and trying to join the system. Make sense? We'll try to dig into a couple of these examples in a second. Any questions? All right, so let's start talking about what these steps look like. So if you want to authenticate someone and then you want to authorize, what do these look like in general and what do they look like in this Google case study? So for authentication, there's really sort of two kinds of authentication that look quite different. So you might want to authenticate a person and that looks very different from trying to authenticate a service or a computer. And the big difference is really that people can't you know, compute fancy math or keep big secrets in their head. So we have to do something different. Uh, so for authenticating people, uh, you know, the, the obvious thing is a password, as I'm sure you've used, and this paper talks about them as well. Um, so the plan is roughly along with the request to your service, right? So probably comes a, a username, and here's my password, and you know, here's the request I'm trying to send. And to authenticate with passwords, you do need to keep some sort of state in the guard or maybe in some other part of the system that's going to help you figure out what is the correct password for any given user. Lots of ways to store them. We'll talk about that next lecture, about human or person authentication in much more detail. Um, that's sort of the general plan, store some table. Passwords, of course, are not so great, so they actually talk about actually mandating two-factor authentication for their employees. Maybe not for end users of Gmail, but for employees, it's important enough because these employees could be a uh, much more significant part of the security story. They actually require the employees must authenticate with uh, two-factor authentication. So here, the plan for two-factor auth is that the employee, maybe in addition to the password, is going to send some kind of a challenge code to the service along with their request. And somehow the service has to figure out, ah, oh, well, that must be the code I sent you, and you wouldn't have typed it anywhere else. And as we talked about, this sometimes, sometimes goes wrong. Next lecture is going to be all about how to make this work particularly well. Make sense? So in this paper, they sort of separate out reasoning about employees for them and end users, partly because I think what's going on is for them, employees actually make RPCs. Like an administrator or an engineer might make an RPC to a service to do some operation. End users don't really do RPCs by themselves. So as far as the RPC library is concerned, end users never really issue RPCs. End users might be encapsulated inside of, inside of an RPC from GFE. So there might be an RPC from GFE that contains inside of it a request from an end user. But it's not really a principle making a request in its own right. Make sense? All right. So that's the story for authenticating persons or people. For authenticating computers, things are a little bit different. And the story, I guess in the general case, is that if you have a computer that you want to authenticate, probably it's going to have some kind of a cryptographic key. And you'll probably use it for signing messages. It's probably the right way to do uh, computer or service authentication these days. And what this looks like in terms of an interaction with a service, here you have a service that's getting a request from another principal that happens to be a computer, maybe another physical machine or a service running somewhere else. You know, the request is going to come along just the same, uh, but it'll have a name of a principal and a cryptographic signature using the, K, the key of the principal over the request being sent. So cryptographic signatures make sure that if you can verify that this request was signed 
by the correct key, only a person with possession of that key could have generated the signature. So there's some kind of a key, KP, that goes with a computer principle that identifies, that authenticates uh, requests coming from that entity. And very much like this password table, you're going to need some table as well to figure out whose key this is. So in Google's case, I imagine there's some kind of a central service that they have that has all the service names and the key for that service, or the public key at least. So, you know, might say that Gmail has a service key of KP for Gmail. I don't know. That's probably the public key, and Gmail has its own secret key. Uh, we'll talk in more details later, but uh, that's roughly what these authentication schemes look like for authenticating a computer or a service to another service. Make sense? Questions about this stuff? Yeah. How often do they rotate these keys? Well, yeah, so why would you rotate keys? Or why would you change passwords for that matter? Well, probably the reason is you think, you know, maybe someone, maybe it was leaked. So in principle, you know, maybe not a strong need to rotate keys for services very often. Uh, because if a key got leaked, uh, maybe you have bigger problems. Uh, but at the same time, the nice thing about service keys or, com uh, or service keys in particular is that you can probably make them fresh every time you start a service. So in some sense, I'm not sure there's a strong need to forcefully rotate them very often. But at the same time, every time you start a service, probably they're going to just give the, key, the service a new key for that instance. And my guess is actually you would probably give different keys to different instances of the service running in different VMs just for good measure. So you can, you know, if one of them turns out to be compromised because someone, you know, stole that physical server, well, you know which key is now potentially in the hands of the adversary. So, um, yeah, a bit of a non-answer, but I think the, the nice thing about it is it's like super cheap to instantiate new keys when you start a service, so I imagine they probably do that. Other questions? All right. So that's how authentication works uh, for sort of at a, at a high level. Uh, so pretty much anything you do is going to involve authentication of that shape, either with people or with computers. The next thing to do is to figure out how to authorize a request. And here, the mental model to have is basically a big matrix. So the question that you have to answer for authorization is really it's a function of the principal that is calling and the resource that you want to access. So one way to think of authorization is that somewhere the policy is going to look like a giant matrix. You're going to have principals on one axis, so maybe Alice and Bob, if they're people, or other services, who knows what. And then on the other axis, you're going to have different files. So, you know, foo.txt, bar.txt, different file names, for example, in a storage system. And the entries in this access control matrix are going to be sort of the operations that you can do. Maybe you can read and write, maybe just read, do nothing, read, write, whatever. So this is what a policy boils down to. And uh, there's really sort of two main ways that computer systems store these policies. Might look sort of, you know, a triviality in some sense, like you can store basically this policy by rows or by columns. Turns out to have pretty big uh, impact and gets used differently, so we'll look at examples of how this Google case study does this. So one way that you might store this giant policy is by rows, and that basically means for a given object like the file foo.txt, here's a row for who can access and do what with this file. So for a row, this is basically an access control list, or an ACL typically called in the security literature. And it, like, you have them in a, every file system on your computer, in AFS. For every file, you can look up which users can do which operations on that file. Make sense? Question. So a principle is anything about which you want to be stating a policy. So if you want to distinguish one kind of request coming from one place versus another place, and you want to 
give different security rights or privileges to those requests, a good way to do it is to n think about those requests coming from two different principles or entities. Uh, so, for example, if you have requests coming from one employee versus another, it's important to pin down this, uh, this is one principle, this is another principle. If you care about whether the request is coming from the employee running on one computer or another, well, maybe then you need the employee on a computer to be a compound principle of some sort. It's like Nikolai on this laptop versus Nikolai on his phone. Those are two different principles. Maybe on the phone it's more or less trustworthy than on my laptop for whatever reason. So it's just whatever you want to talk about having a policy about. Any other questions? All right. So let's talk about back to authorization. So storing these policy decisions by object turns into basically a list or an access control list for that object. And uh, this shows up in a bunch of systems, in file systems, as I guess I mentioned. Where does this show up for Google's case study? Where do you see, I guess, policies stored by object or resource you want to protect? Do they have interesting authorization decisions happening? Or wh where do they happen? Yeah, back there. Yeah, so I think one thing that's going on is probably like whole sort like this RPC library. So RPC permissions are probably kind of like an ACL for them. So that's one high level policy. Um, another uh, place where maybe this shows up in the Google case study is individual services, like maybe the storage service itself is going to store lots of messages for Gmail or lots of contact entries. And for each of those guys, probably the application is going to say, oh, this contact entry, only make it accessible to that user, et cetera. So that if a different user accidentally asks for someone else's contact entries, the storage system says no. So this shows up in a bunch of places. Um, one nice thing about storing permissions by file is that it's actually very easy to answer the question of who has access to a file. This turns out to be a useful thing for RPC. For example, if you want to audit your configuration of your data center and figure out who can talk to Gmail, well, if it's stored by services, you can pretty easily figure out who can Gmail talk to. If this is all stored in one place, it's easy to answer those questions. The converse of storing sort of access control lists is typically thought of as storing these columns. And this usually looks kind of like a, or typically called a capability. So the idea by storing by columns is sort of thinking of, well, here's all the stuff that Alice can access, or here's all the stuff that Bob or this other principal can access. So you can just present a request and say, look, I am allowed to access this file. Give it to me. It doesn't matter who I am. Here's my capability. I am allowed to do this. The big example of this kind of uh, technique in Google's design, I think, shows up in these uh, end user permission tickets that they talk about. So this end user permission ticket is something that when I send a request to Gmail, for example, some service, maybe GFE or Gmail, gets one of these tickets on my behalf. And then it doesn't actually matter which service now presents this ticket. It can sort of impersonate me for the duration of that ticket's lifetime. So if Gmail gives this ticket to the calendar service or to the storage service, they can all realize, oh, yeah, this request is coming from someone that is allowed to speak for Nikolai. And uh, they will be able to operate on whatever object on, on my behalf. So the nice thing about capabilities is that it's really easy to de delegate them. So what I mean by this is that if you were trying to give some new service access to my data, using the access control plan, say I send a RPC to Gmail or a request to Gmail, and I want to have Gmail access my calendar or contact book. Well, if the contact service doesn't have access to my 
uh, data, all of a sudden Gmail now has to like add a new entry to the access control list, allow the contact service to do something, then re revoke that entry. That's a bit of a mess. But using capabilities, it's much easier to sort of temporarily delegate some privilege to a service like contacts. And then uh, you don't have to actually go and change permissions on disk like an access control list. So typically these kinds of capability schemes like these end user tickets that Google talks about are usually used for delegation and for much more short-lived uh, access control. And the reason this is sort of important is, one, you can't actually answer the question of who has access. If you have a, this capability floating around, like if there's an end user permission ticket on my behalf that was created by some service, it's not actually exactly clear at any given moment which other service might have gotten a copy of my ticket. Because my ticket went to Gmail, Gmail sent it to the contact service, that might have sent it somewhere else. I don't know where it all ended up. And if these tickets were particularly long-lived, I'd be kind of in trouble because if I ever do anything with Gmail, I might have sent my tickets all over the place. And now all kinds of services can do things to my data. By making these tickets short-lived, you sort of avoid this problem. Worst case, you can wait a couple of seconds for these tickets to expire, and then no one can access your data unless you send another request. So that's why these capabilities typically end up being a short-term access control uh, mechanism used largely for delegation. Makes sense? To some extent? It's like not super well described in the paper, but hopefully, yeah, question. Uh-huh. So, question is, how do these access control lists look like in intrusion detection systems? Yeah, so I think intrusion detection systems look quite different. So, for many of these intrusion detection systems, the goal is you have a whole bunch of log entries, and you're trying to look for some suspicious pattern of, like, one employee extracting thousands of user records of data. So, in an intrusion detection system, usually all the requests are already approved by the policy. So, you're usually looking at this audit log for intrusion detection. So, everything was already allowed, however you specified it, in ACLs or capabilities or whatever. The use of intrusion detection systems and sort of this audit log is really for situations where you screwed up the policy. So, sort of not super, I think, meaningful to talk about what exactly is the ACL or the policy here. You're really trying to look for anomalies so then someone can look and say, well, is that actually okay or is this indicative of that we screwed up something in the policy or the authentication or what have you? So I think that's where intrusion detection shows up. Uh, kind of like a heuristic thing. Uh, I think it, in the case of Google, I think it's by and large a response to insider threats uh, and those guys probably are situations where the principal has access but is abusing it. So, maybe makes some sense. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want more complex logic uh, in this ACL, like, you know, you can only access it twice or only after 5 p.m. or something. I mean, yeah, you could surely do it, right? So, so I guess uh, none of this stuff is like an exact API that you have to use. Um, I think this is, as with much of this architectural discussion, it's really a way of thinking and structuring your thinking about how to architect the overall software. And, uh, I mean, if you need to talk about time for access control or something, yeah, you can certainly add it. Um, but the main idea here, or the most important thing, is to make sure there's one place that checks it. So, you know, if you need to extend it with another dimension or, you know, surely do it, yeah. These are more sort of high design level, high level designs that sort of fuzzy by goal, maybe, yeah. Question? So what happens when you try to access a Google Drive doc you don't have access to? That's an interesting question. So we can try to try to figure out how to trace it through. So if you try to access some Google Doc, 
than our Google Drive doc. So presumably, your request is going to come into this GFE. And presumably, you're logged into your Gmail account, or otherwise, GFE will force you to log in to access the Google Doc. Then the GFE, I think, is going to obtain this ticket on your behalf. So let's say I'm trying to access Kevin's document. My browser is going to send a request to the GFE and get a ticket for Nikolai. Then that thing is going to send a request to Google Drive, maybe instead of Gmail, with my ticket. So on a Google Drive, that app, that service, knows that request comes in for Kevin's document, uh, but it's actually Nikolai is the source of the request. And then it's sort of a question, I don't know for Google Drive in particular, are they going to enforce that check inside of the Google Drive service? Or are they going to rely on the underlying storage service to make that determination? So one reason to enforce in Google Drive might be because they have complicated rules, as you were saying. Like if the rules are not something that the storage service itself can enforce, then you have to check them in Google Drive, probably. And then the Google Drive service can look and say, ah, well, this doc belongs to Kevin. This request is from Nikolai. That document from Kevin says only Kevin can access it, so we'll reject it right there. The downside of that, right, is that now the Google Drive service is in charge of making that decision. And if that Google Drive service is buggy, well, now maybe I'll bypass it in some way. Who knows what's going on? So uh, if it's possible, a better plan is actually to enforce this inside of the storage service. Because then what's going on is that a request from Nikolai comes into the Google Drive app, and it actually gets forwarded to the storage app, to the storage service, even though maybe I don't have access. But now there's one place in the storage service that basically everyone at Google has checked. It does access control correctly because it is used by everyone. So this economy of mechanism is nice if the storage service can now look at this request and say it's not allowed. There's actually one more part, like one of the fanciest things that this paper talks about is the fact that the storage service actually encrypts data with per user keys, which is really cool. So Kevin's Google Drive docs might actually be encrypted with one key that only Kevin can access, and files that I have access to will be encrypted with a different encryption key. So the way this works is, I believe, uh, you might have, let me find another board. So you might have the storage service, and some request comes in to like get some document, and on disk, these documents are actually encrypted. And the key actually comes from this key management service that they mention in the paper. The key management service has a whole bunch of keys, like all of Kevin's documents have a key here for encrypting them. All of my documents have a key. And when the storage service asks the key management service to get the key for you know, Kevin's document, well, now the key management service is only going to give Kevin's key if it has Kevin's ticket in the request. But it only has Nikolai's ticket in the request because I'm trying to read Kevin's document. So now the key management service just doesn't give it out. And now the storage service, even if it's buggy, cannot leak Kevin's document. So there's sort of varying degrees of how this might work depending on, you know, how they choose to implement Google Drive and what features they need, but uh, the really nice property of their security architecture is that it's possible to really push the security enforcement all the way to this like really small key management service or storage service that just looks at whose data, are you, whose key are you trying to get, and who are you. And this is like one place that they get right, and if they get this right, it doesn't matter. Your data is encrypted on disk. No one can decrypt it. They still have lots and lots of other measures, but it's really cool. They can really push us down this far. And a question? Yeah, so, so your, your question is, okay, so like this is a very simplistic model. What if you want to say, well, you know, that's all well and good, here's your permissions, but if you access a thousand files in a row, maybe we'll start saying no. So I think you, you, you see examples of that in a bunch of places. Maybe the most prominent example where it shows up in the paper is where they mention that actually for user login specifically, they look at a ton of different signals. So it might be that sometimes you try to log in and they'll just accept your password because they know it's from the same computer you logged in before. 
Other times, if it's from a different country, they'll maybe say, oh, you have to supply two-factor auth, even though you recently logged in with two-factor. That's from a different country. Let's double-check it. Maybe they'll ask you for a recovery phone number or a backup email address. So they have a much more sort of context-aware uh, scheme for authentication. You could imagine having that for authorization as well, of course. I didn't see any examples of this in this paper, but totally would make sense. And I think many systems outside of Google that talk about insider attacks often have this style of policies where for employees, you might be able to allow to access stuff, but if you're accessing too much, it'll say, well, no, you can only access a thousand things in the next one, please wait. Yeah. Makes sense. Question? In terms of what's missing, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think they probably have a much better sense of what attacks are real or not. Um, yeah. I think there's a number of things we haven't talked about here that mostly fall in the bugs category. How do you make the software bug-free? And they talk about some of them. You could imagine there's many approaches you could take. They're sort of separate from this paper. They're pretty sophisticated about worrying about bugs. But I think one place where this architecture picture doesn't quite say everything is how do you know the software is trustworthy? Yeah. There's another question from? Four more. Four more. All right, excellent. I think the answer is really here's the things they're good at. The row view is good for long term storage because you can answer the question of who has access because you can just look up and say, ah, oh, yeah, here's who has access. You can revoke access. You can give access, etc. The column view is great for delegation, this kind of ticket thing. That's easy to do with columns, with this capability or a ticket-like thing that you forward, but it's not good at answering question of who has access, so you can't really make it long-term. So they're sort of used for different aspects. You see them actually show up in most systems, actually. You see them showing up in smartphones and Android. These Both things show up in web browsers. Both things show up. Many systems have sort of aspects of long-term ACLs and short-term short -term capabilities. Uh, let me not recap that. I will move on. Yeah, so, okay, good question about the audit log storing approved requests. You might actually very well have rejections stored here as well, just in terms of being able to track down either things where, ah, you accidentally prevented the good guy from doing something useful, or also to track down someone probing your internal system. So, indeed, for many intrusion detection tasks, uh, it's pretty common to store failures as well uh, to track down someone probing internal systems, yeah. Ah, yeah, great question about like having this key management system back here, oh yeah, over there, or other sort of, you know, GFEs or other sort of central services. So that's, a, that's an interesting question, right? So it is certainly a central point where everything relies on that. I think this is, might be where fault tolerance and security are slightly different. So for security, you really want to make sure the bad guy can't get in or get someone's key. And for that, you really want to engineer it to not have any bugs or not, not have any mistakes in its implementation. And you're not so much worried about maybe availability there uh, with respect to sort of statistical failures. So having one point of failure might be bad if you're thinking, ah, oh, well, having more would be less prone to failure. So if one goes down and there's another copy, well, it's good for availability. But actually, in some senses, neither here nor there may be worse for security if you have many copies because now there's many places you could attack. So having many instances of KMS is probably okay for security as long as they're all running the same code, because that means now that if one of them is carefully audited and bug-free, then all the other ones are good as well. If you had five different KMSs all running different code, that would be strictly worse for security because you just pick the worst implemented one and go find the bugs there, even though maybe it's good for availability. So I think a sort of single point of failure for availability and fault tolerance is really not quite the same thing as single points of failure for security. 
Although there's you know, something to be said for maybe for physical attacks, you might worry about this. And I think Google has some sophistication in this regard where, where they have data in many different countries. I think they have different KMS servers in different countries for keys for data stored in that country. Because there, they start worrying about, well, maybe the government of that country comes and seizes the KMS server there. And there, some sort of separation makes sense. But then, of course, you would only want to store a subset of your keys there, not all the keys. So there are some reasons to, to sort of split up this KMS service, and I believe they do, even though the paper doesn't say it. Uh, but more for, I think, physical control for people coming in and seizing your KMS server. All right, other questions? Ah, oh, it's totally up there. Like, this is a design level thing, man, yeah. <laughs> I think you could imagine lots of things where you keep it for a week. Some things keep it for years for some financial regulation. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, so let's talk about DOS attacks, I guess, if that's an interesting question to uh, discuss. So for um, availability purposes, they have this GFE service that we showed up here. That's actually quite an interesting story here, right? Because for DOS attacks, it, the, sort of the problem statement looks very different from the kinds of security problems we've talked about so far. So for DOS attacks, the, the setting really, right, is that you have some service and you have lots of requests coming in from the internet and they're all trying to overwhelm the service. This might be because they're just trying to make sure your service doesn't work or maybe they're trying to blackmail you saying, pay us $1,000 or we'll keep breaking your server and making it unavailable, etc. And the challenge really is really distinguishing real versus attack requests. Well, this is hard to do, especially on the internet, because it's an open network. Anyone, in principle, should be able to talk to your service on the internet, if it's a public-facing service. And it's difficult to distinguish whether this is an attack request or a real request of a real user. And if you can't tell them apart, you're going to have trouble sort of satisfying all the fake requests and the real requests at the same time. So this is what makes DOS attacks tricky for them. And what they do is, I think in this GFE front end, well, what's their plan? I think plan number one for them is uh, over-provision. That's a pretty standard plan for dealing with DOS attacks, which is have a lot of bandwidth. And if the bad guy tries to send you a gigabyte of traffic, that's fine. We have many gigabits of traffic available to us. Um, so that's sort of always strategy number one. Um, strategy number two is really to authenticate. So the reason why DOS attacks are difficult to deal with is because you have a hard time distinguishing real versus fake requests. And you want to make sure that you don't use many resources until you've figured out whether this request is real or fake. Otherwise, you're wasting resources. So one reason why GFE being a central thing is kind of a cool trick here is they've implemented once and for all a very carefully done implementation that's going to authenticate a user without using a whole lot of resources in doing so. So GFE is going to force you to log in if the service might be under attack. And then once you're logged in, then GFE can decide if this is a real or an attack request by looking at which Gmail account it's from, et cetera, et cetera. Once you authenticate it, DOS attacks are much easier to deal with. So the trick for DOS attacks is really to authenticate as soon as possible and then get out of this challenging problem of differentiating real versus attack requests. Does this make sense? Questions about this DOS attack stuff? All right, so let me cover one last cool aspect of their design uh, in the remaining five or so minutes. And that is their plan for how to establish trust in the servers and software they're running. So how do you trust the servers in a data center? So the concrete question for them is there's some kind of a cluster manager. This is the Borg service that the paper talks about. And you might have a new server that plugs into your data center and it needs to start running some applications. Like you need to start running Gmail, Google Docs, all the stuff on this machine. The way this happens is that the machine boots up and you know sends a request to the cluster manager saying, ah, register me. The problem is, of course, why should you trust some random machine contacting the cluster manager saying, register me? 
Because the threat here, well, you can imagine lots of threats. One threat might be the bad guy, as we were talking before, ships some extra servers to you. You plug them in, power them up, they register, but they're actually running malicious software, and they'll corrupt whatever VM you place on them. Or it might be that some data center operator goes in and modifies the OS on the server, or modifies the BIOS, or something in the bootloader sequence. These are the kinds of attacks they want to prevent. They want to make sure that whenever the cluster manager gets a new machine to use, it's actually trustworthy. There's some reason to believe this is a good machine in their data center. And to that extent, they have this sort of cool security chip. I think this is the Titan security chip that they are using. And what's going on is that this is a separate little processor inside of the server box with its own key called KT for the Titan chip. And it actually inter sort of integrates itself into the server boot process. So when the server first starts up, typically, it starts running some BIOS code uh, to start booting up, and then it loads the OS kernel from disk and uh, starts running that, et cetera. What's going on is I think Google has actually gotten the motherboard manufacturer to change the boot process a little bit in some way. So when you start booting, it's actually the Titan chip that starts running, and it actually takes the BIOS and computes a hash of it. So it computes a hash of the BIOS and then starts running the BIOS code. Then when it starts loading the OS from disk, the Titan chip gets a copy of the OS that is about to run and hashes that as well. And eventually the OS boots up and generates some kind of a key for the operating system. And that also gets sent to the Titan chip. And now this whole thing gets signed by the Titan chip and sent over in the registration request to the cluster manager. So in some sense, the request to register a server is not actually coming from this operating system, but it's actually coming from the Titan chip inside of this machine. And the reason that the cluster manager is going to trust that is because there's a table of all the legit Titan chips Google ever manufactured. So there's some, some kind of a table. You know, here's the security chip, number one, two, three. Here's the key for that chip. So there's some table like this in some key management service that they have or some directory service. And this is how the cluster manager is going to decide that, ah, this is a real server that booted up. I should trust it first because I know it's coming from this chip I trust. And then the cluster manager is going to look at what BIOS and operating system that machine just booted up. And if that looks like a good BIOS and a good OS, then, yeah, let's run it. If someone installed a bad OS here, then it's not going to allow this machine to join the cluster. This is a pretty sophisticated plan for them to deal with these sort of physical attacks. Make sense? And I have a similar, actually, pretty cool story for how to deal with software as well. So in the cluster manager, when the cluster manager is about to send some code to run on the server inside of a VM, they don't actually allow their developers, as far as I can tell, to just say, oh, yeah, run this binary for Gmail. You can only actually tell the cluster manager, you know, some, some kind of a config here. The config can only point to some kind of a source code commit, like a version of the software that you want to run. And then the cluster manager is actually going to schedule a build job on the same cluster it's managing. And then the build job is going to produce a binary. And that's the binary that the cluster manager is going to ship off to run on this new machine. So this way, they have provenance or tracking of why am I running this code? Well, it's not just some binary that, you know, engineer Joe gave me when they decided here's the new Gmail service. But actually, they know it's the source code that we just built, and we built it on the cluster. We know it's a trustworthy cluster. This is a binary. That's what we are running. So there's a very careful, precise chain of trust for all the software running that gives us a reason to believe that this is the correct software for the correct source code revision on hardware that we trust running the right OS, all this stuff. So this is a pretty nice, tight story in some ways. There's more to it that the paper talks about that we're not going to cover about reviews and all this stuff about how to get the software to be trustworthy and bug-free, but it's a very nice piece of infrastructure they've cooked up for really tying everything together. It takes a lot of effort, but it's an impressive case study. So hopefully it's give you some perspective on how a large service operates. And uh, next Tuesday, we're going to start talking about user authentication, dive into some details there. See you guys next week.